everybody, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Coco, how are you doing? Um, I've really been debating changing my drag name, but since I'm incredibly well established and so popular, I think I'm not. What what are possible drag names you would change? So I thought to? about being Career Woman Kathy. Mm, um that's, that's, that's snappy. That's <laughs> and then I thought about changing it to Clea Gem Holiday. Oh, okay. Um I don't know, Clea just felt like it rolled better for me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And but that's kinda like it. like or it was um it was gonna be like oh or Becky from Bookkeeping. Becky from Bookkeeping. Okay. I dig Becky it. With the just all these hair. career woman drag names that are coming out ever since uh Karen from Finance, right? I know, and I just really wanted to be like I, I wanted to have a drag name that symbolize symbolize how I'm like the business fish. I love how I just tripped over that word like I've been drinking, but I haven't at all. No. Normally I'm sauced during these <laughs> listeners. Like I like I throw it back real hard. We're quite sober. <laughs> so back to drag names though. I uh, I never had um I had a couple of ideas in mind before I was Donatella My Secrets that on mm-hmm. names that I wanted to choose. Um and one of them was Petra Core. Um as when I brought that name up to friends, they're like, she would have been like some hippie bitch that like mm-hmm. smelled like patchouli. And yes, she would have. Um, <laughs> because petrichor is the smell of rain. Um, that's what that means. And um, then there uh, also was uh, the less classy Taryn Mavage. That's so classy. <laughs> Much less classy. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I have another drag name that I'm really considering, but I'm not going to give it away because like, the thing is, like, it does suck when there's another drag queen in the world who has your drag name. Yeah. Because I've always, one thing I always hated about Coco was the fact that, like, Coco is the most common name for, like, a black person in any capacity. Like, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, but I'm not going to tell you, listeners. It's my secret. It's a secret, and we can't have you um, taking it all of a sudden. Um, but yeah, yeah, those were the names that I would have. Taryn Mavage. It's terrible. Actually, it? you know, the funny thing is I hate the name so bad. Um, yeah. It's kind of like Torah Hyman. I'm just, um, but, um, <clears throat> the reason I hate it, but I love it at the same time is because Taryn, like I love the name Taryn. I, I love the name Taryn too. That would have been so T-A-R-Y-N. cute. T-A-R-Y-N. Yeah. Like Taryn yeah, Manning. Like, Taryn, how are yeah. you doing? Oh my God. That's so cute. Yeah. Yeah. I like the name Taryn. Yeah. So maybe if, if you could think of something else. That's <laughs> the last name. It's a good drag name. It should it should do tearing it up. Tearing it up. Oh yeah, tearing I love a good. Up. I love names that are just like you know a play on words, whatever, what have you. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was a uh, almost four minute intro talking know, about talk, drag names. Drag names, but you know we haven't been talking a lot about drag on here. So we actually have two different topics that are kind of actually drag related this week. We do. Lates and gents, or sorry, ladies and gentle thems. Yes. <laughs> gender inclusive terms we live in Portland. Yes, exactly. Um, so we read an article today about Darcells um, might possibly be closing. And yeah. and so for those of you who don't live in Portland who listen to this, like my mom, um, Darcells is one of the oldest drag clubs um, in Portland. It's one of those places where, I mean, it's Dar- Darcel, what is it, 15, I yes. believe? Um, actually, I don't even know if that's the... Darcel 15, it is 15, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, XV. Because <laughs> Roman numerals are hard. Yes. Um, yeah, so there was an article that came out um, at the, as the releasing of this episode, I think, um, a day ago, that basically talks about how Walter Cole, Cole who is Darcel, um, who is going to be turning 90 years old this year, uh, might have to be closing Darcel's uh, 15 show place at 208 Northwest 3rd Avenue. Yeah, and I mean, this is very much to do with the current pandemic. It is the reason why um, this is the case, because capacity can't really be filled at Darcells right now um, with the restrictions that are in place. And um, there has been, you know, COVID relief funds, but even that, with no steady business, it's really hard to keep businesses that rely on people coming Mm -hmm. in to fill seats alive during this time. Yeah. And that's um, that includes restaurants and um, any venues that you go to watch shows at. But unfortunately, Darcells is one of those historic venues um, and one of the most iconic performers, one the most iconic performer in Portland because of, um, you know, their history in the scene and uh, doing drag here. Yeah, so Darcell um, 
holds the Guinness World Record for the oldest performing drag queen. Yes. Um, and so that's why Darcel is so well known across the country and around the world. Mm-hmm. And so this is their show place. Like they have uh, shows. To, uh, on Fridays, they have shows pretty much every day of the week, yes. almost. But um, yeah, so it, it's it's so much a part of Portland's legacy, like this place that exists that shows drag and like showcases artistry, and it's it's kind of heartbreaking to think about. Like, and like Donna said, like COVID really is affecting us all in different ways. Yeah, and I know we talk about COVID a lot on here, but we didn't back when we first talked about it in March on our podcast, or right around that time. We really didn't expect that it would still be going on this long. No, we didn't. We expected that during the summer, like, it was something that would last for the spring. Because it was, like, what? Around the first day of spring is when Mm -hmm. all of this really started. Yeah, so we've gone through now, like, two, like, two seasons. Um, You know, we're almost, we're getting towards the end of, I mean, not, I wouldn't say that yet. But we are getting towards, like, the past the midpoint of summer. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's a little bit crazy to think that this is still, still going on and, um, the effects that it's had on everyone and everything in our world. Yeah. Especially hookup culture. Like the one thing I see online from all my hoish friends is Mm -hmm. that like they don't hook up right now because they just can't be, uh, cause you have to think about it. Like it's about bringing something new into your like personal ecosystem. Like, yeah. and they can't do hookups because those are close contact encounters and people can't be introducing a new specimen into their universe. Yeah. Like it's changed dating to obviously drag queen venues, um, to a bunch of other things. And it's, it's so crazy. It's affected all of our mental health. That's effing true. <laughs> I was so, um, so I work at a bank and I was working at one of the, one of our branches today um and all of the branches at the bank i work at um are only drive through only for uh-huh. safety reasons and we still are quote unquote technically supposed to be wearing our masks the entire time we're inside and i'm growing out my facial hair to be more of a bearded beauty and i can tell you right now it sucks wearing a mask all day with it scratching up against my skin yeah. oh heavens like i didn't i didn't realize that pain oh man i would go to the bathroom for a second just to be like ooh. And just, like, fan off my face. Yeah. And then put it back on to go back to work. And I was there for eight hours today. And it was, yeah. it was, um, it was really eye-opening. Um, so the one thing is I really, we do have to, so as a positive note, if you do see entertainers online posting, like, Venmos or Cash Apps or, you know, businesses. Contribute. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. Contribute. Entertainers, if you can. businesses, whatever. Yeah. Anything that's close to your heart, you know? I mean, and I think Darcel's is a place that's close to a lot of people's hearts because it was one of the first places that I really got to perform on a big stage here in Portland. Um, it, it really, during the uh, Catch a Rising Star shows where they let anyone um, come in and, and give give their shot out on a cabaret-style theater stage, it really does open a lot of doors and um, give a really cool opportunities to new entertainers, not only to the city, but just new entertainers in general. So um, not only is it iconic for that reason, but the shows that um, Darcells does um, that run all week long. It's something that this place is known for, and it's one of the big parts um, of Portland culture. Just like making a trip to Voodoo Donuts or walking the waterfront. It's something that once you visit Portland, you have to do um, and see. So it's just sad to know that it's been affected by this pandemic as, as much as, you know, everything else has, because it is... It is such a historic place. Yeah, definitely. And I wanted to mention that, well, Donna actually told me this before we started, but they have, like, they're in, you know, a trial phase for a phase, like, they're in phase one of testing a vaccine out. Yes, Moderna, I think, is the name of it. Um, and they they finished phase one trials, and that was only a test group of 45 people. But it's promising, it's looking promising, but that means that there are two other phases to go through um, for the vaccine um, and much larger test groups to mm-hmm. test and also um, just basically paying it close attention to side effects, if the immunity lasts with the vaccine, how long it lasts. Mm-hmm. Um, we're still in fairly early stages of getting it out to the public, which is troubling um, yeah. just because... I mean, and that's not to, like, say that those efforts of getting this established aren't, you know, to be, like, applauded or anything, but this is not the timeline that we expected for this. And I, I think that that's something that's going to continue to surprise us. I think right. 
I think we should be prepared to go into a full year over a full year of this. Yeah, definitely. I, I really think so. And what's been really driving me crazy, like, and we kind of talked about this on one of our episodes about social media. Um, so I have dialogues in, per- in person with people uh, about these subjects and like it's it's so weird to me how some people still think of it as like a conspiracy or the government is trying to like keep us down or like all these things that just don't kind of make sense like most people I know know someone who's been affected by COVID in some capacity and I'm not talking about losing a job I'm talking about getting um getting COVID and or people dying you know and- the conspiracy loons really still piss me off yeah. Because, you know what, there was the 30-year-old, the 30-year-old that, that thought it was a conspiracy in, in Florida or where, wherever it was, that went to the party because he thought the disease was a conspiracy, and it was a mm-hmm. COVID contraction party where you could purposely contract the disease. Yikes. And he ended up dying. He ended up dying in his hospital bed, and the nurse even said um, some of his last words were, um, I think I made a really big mistake. And, yeah, no shit, you did, because this is this is real. This is real. Yeah, it's very real. And, and one thing that's been really aggravating me is just a side note, is that with the BLM movie ha- movement happening right now, and then having people with conspiracy theorists, and then lots of conservatives on the internet um, being really aggressive and loud right now because they feel really oppressed and everybody's going stir crazy because COVID, I'm finding more and more people in my life that have just definitely for lack of a better term, just disappointed me. Yeah. I, I've, I've found, me and Donna talk about this quite frequently offline, about how we are stuck in a zone with our families and friends where they're saying things that are oppressing us or saying things that we just can't keep hearing over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to say, but, like, I know this is, it's not a difference of an opinion. I can honestly say a lot of these views are just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> just absolutely wrong. And sometimes it's a fundamental difference in values. Like, yeah. and, and when it comes to opinion and values, like, I think that's a little bit different, Yeah, you know, like difference of, of opinion, that's where you can agree to disagree. Yeah. That's a difference of opinion. When it's a difference in fundamental values, that's where you have to question what the other party is saying if it completely negates your own values. Right. You know? And so that's, that's, I think, where it comes into this point where there, it's been a lot of combativeness amongst um, different sides. And, you know, it's it's just been, it's, tensions have been very, very high. It has been. And I've been really hurt by a lot of people, too, like, because of some of these subjects. Like, it's, it's so, and I'm not even, like, I'll let people make jokes or whatever, even though I don't think it's, like, the time to make jokes. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one thing that does get to me is people are like, oh, this is, oh, because I, so here's a story. So I um, I was out um, at a f- facility with my friend because they went to court. And it just changed the whole justice system because of, like, mm. you had to sit in the hallway, you know, if you were just a spectator. Normally you could support your friends and family when they're going to court and whatever. And so I had to sit in the hallway the whole time. And I had to sit six feet apart from people. I had to wear my mask the entire time when I was in the, in the building. And then... Um, and like, I remember there was a guy who got pissed because he felt like it was going too slow. And so one of the people at the courthouse came out and said, they're like, this is how it is because of COVID. And we know it's just, and he basically said he thinks it's ridiculous, Mm -hmm. but, um, trying to do that, like, oh, we're all in this together and we just think it's ridiculous. And I was like, well, I don't really think it's ridiculous. I was like, I think all of this is hard. But um, necessary. And necessary. And I was like, so we just all have to just be safe. Like, why can't we ever put the... Um, importance and the emphasis on safety. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, but I forgot to ask, you know, because I was just doing my rant. Uh, Donna, how are you doing this evening? I'll let you know after this brief commercial break. Do you need handcrafted items for your spiritual practice? Check out Red Wizard Wares by Joshua Bloodfire the drag artist formerly known as Valentine Anger. Red Wizard Wares offers items such as Florida water, candle magic, oils, hand poured candles, soaps, and much, much more. Joshua also offers rune readings and other spiritual services. Find all this and more at www.redwizardwares.com. Use promo code REDWIZ20 and it'll get you 20% off on your first order. Follow Joshua on Instagram at Joshua underscore Bloodfire and at Red Wizard Wears. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna. Tell a podcast. 
Tune in to What They Tell You Podcast. Check it out. With Coco and Donna Tell a Podcast. Check it out. Last night I lay in bed so blue Cause I realized the truth They can't love me like you I'm in a sing-songy mood Because <laughs> we're gonna talk about drag queen singing Oh uh, yeah <laughs> Super confused of where she was going with that <laughs> So as you guys know that me and Donna Were part of a girl group called Little Tricks And a girl group before that called the CDs Yeah um, Yeah, and we've sang in drag which times And uh, there is just such a huge stigma about drag queen singing. Like Donna said during our pre-show, like, she basically said she's like, there are some people who do not want their drag artists to sing. Yeah, they don't want to hear their drag queen singing. And there's also a lot of drag queens that shouldn't sing. I think in certain cases, I'm one of them. But... <laughs> <laughs> because just because you took um, some musical theater classes doesn't mean you should sing live all the time. You know? Like, yeah. I think that that's fair. I'm no professional singer, but I have sang pretty much all my life. I feel like all you have to do to be a professional singer is get paid to sing. And yeah. you've been paid to sing. Oh, that's true. Not, I have been not, paid to not sing. Not at a karaoke, but even at a, no, but at I've, a gig. Yeah, yeah, I've had gigs where I've, I, I've had gigs that specifically wanted us to sing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we were paid for. So yeah, I guess so. Um, I'm, not, I'm not professionally trained. How about that? There you go. I'm not a professionally trained singer. Um, Autumn introduced me to Kinky Boots, actually. And the funny thing is, I always heard about Kinky Boots, and Donna told me about Kinky Boots. Uh -huh. But, like, somebody has to literally force something down my throat. Like, Donna's been trying to make me watch She's Gotta Have It for about 30 years. Yes, the show, not the movie, the Spike Lee show. It's so good. If anyone else has watched it, like, come on, have my back <laughs> on this. But it's, like, amazing. And co I've tried to get her to watch it for, like, I want to say three years now. I've been asking her to watch it. And she won't pay any attention to it. By the way, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina got canceled. I did see that. Yeah, that's sad. Um, also, the Kate Kane or whatever, like that River, uh, Riverview spinoff, uh -huh. got canceled as well. Really? Yeah, like everything in the River uh, Riverdale, Riverdale universe. universe is getting canceled. That's bullshit. Which sucks, because Josie from Josie and the Pussycats, she the had... black character, <laughs> got put on that show, and now it's canceled. So it's like, god dang it, they are just erasing black people from Riverdale. God damn it. Yeah, it really makes me... Very upset, honestly. There was supposed to be, like, a whole Riverdale witches crossover episode that was supposed to happen in season five, too. And they're like, nope, we're gonna give you this next season, and that's it. But we digress. Singing and drag. Singing and drag. <laughs> those shows. Yeah, no, and um, we, and I think we said this on an earlier show, but for those of you who don't go back and listen, uh, we met Courtney Act at the Austin yeah. International Drag Festival, and I asked her about that. I said, what do you, I was like, there's such a stigma about drag queen singing, like, how do you deal with that? And she's like, I didn't know that there was one because she's from Australia and she speaks weird. But um, she literally said, I didn't know that there was one. And if there really is a stigma like that, then fuck them is what she said. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's I cool. think uh, for a lot of people, they're like, well, you have a male voice, so it ruins the illusion. And I think that's bullshit. Um, I think it's great if you can sing in a falsetto the entire time and really do that, like give a female illusion. Good for you. My register is not quite there. I'm, mm -hmm. I would say like I'm a, I'm a Barrett baritoner barrett yeah i'd baritone. say i'm a baritone i'm a solid baritone yeah i'm i'm more of a baritone too like yeah i can get my high notes when i need to but like it takes some vocal training because like it does so for instance like so shows like kinky boots like which this is just an interesting story i actually didn't know what kinky boots was about i didn't realize it was specifically about a black drag queen mm -hmm. um you know who's discovered is you know how can we make good high-heeled boots for drag queens. Yeah. Really well-known Broadway musical. Yeah. Like, which is so crazy. And then we watched the movie and we watched the musical and all were great. And well, it was a movie before it was a musical. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. that movie is absolutely fantastic. That's so good. I watched yeah. that back in college and I, I loved it. It was one of the first gay movies I watched. Yeah. Honestly, speaking of gay movies, that is probably one of my, one of my favorites outside of, um... Julie, ne wait, oh gosh. Tu Wong Fu. Tu Wong Fu. Tu Wong Fu's classic. Yeah. What is the rest of the title, though? Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. Thanks for everything, Julie because Newmar. Because it's, it's the signature on the on her, on her Julie Newmar's photo. Right. And she's the one that crowns the winner mm -hmm. in the end, in the very end of the movie. I know. Yeah. I love that movie. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. You get to see young RuPaul, young Coco Peru. Yeah. 
Um, and I haven't actually, and just as a side note about these movies, like, I haven't actually finished watching The Birdcage. i have like, halfway through. Um, I wasn't really entertained by it. I just know it's oh, a I classic. It. I but... I love Robin Williams, though. I do love Robin Williams. And yeah. it's, a, it's supposed to be a good movie. But I did like Priscilla. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert is actually pretty it solid. It is really good. It is really good. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just like, that's that's your queer history. We should we should honestly just do an entire episode dedicated to cinema. Honestly, oh, there we go. I, Next week's topic. Yeah, I have I have many many movies I would like to talk about. Ooh, yeah, me too. Actually, when it comes to queer related art, yeah. Um, so stigmas and stigmas. Drag. <laughs> yeah, aside from singing, not just singing. So yeah, singing is definitely one of them, and it's something that we've gotten. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think. Keep singing if you can, and if there's a song that fits your voice and you want to sing along with your friends to it too, then by golly, do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, so, and here's the thing though, and this is kind of probably sound like more tea than necessary in our podcast, but so I was helping a friend out by writing to people on Grindr for her um, to see, um, just to see like what people would say. And in the first, one of the first four messages, no matter how I got there, I would always say, like, oh, and I'm a drag queen in some kind of cutesy way. I'm really good at relationships, just FYI. And so, like, I was throwing it out there. And what I noticed, which was so interesting, is that because my friend is deemed pretty societally attractive, especially with the photos they use on Grinder, and people didn't have a super problem with it because the attractiveness level to how, like, the how much, not the attractiveness, the how much I want to sleep with you level did not counteract the I hate drag queens. It was level. also grinder too, and they're not yeah. looking for like match dot com relationships. No, they're not. And I think that that's incredibly fascinating because back in the day when I was on Grinder and I was a drag queen, like my not wanting to fuck me level, but post to being a drag queen, oh, both hurt me so bad. I've <laughs> had people flat out that after we hook up find out I was a drag queen and be like, "You didn't tell me," and I purposely don't sleep with drag queens. I've had people tell me that. Uh, because yeah. I don't, I don't disclose it. Like I'm not dating you. Like if we're just hooking up, then I don't feel the need to disclose. It. Hey, I'm a drag queen, by the way. No, yeah, like, exactly. Drag queens need dick too. You know, like that's <laughs> in fact probably more so than men. Oh, most of us, you so know, much. like we are dick pigs. But seriously, but it is a stigma. Like men don't want to date drag queens, and and I know that we actually have a lot of cis people who listen to our uh, podcast. So let me explain something. I know you're immediately thinking, well, of course. Like, why would they like if they're gay? Why would they want to sleep with a dude who you know does drag? Because that's like being a woman, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or some or some of our cis listeners out there, cisgender listeners, are probably thinking like, well, of course they feel like you're lying to them. Mm-hmm. The fact of the matter is, when it comes to hookup culture, especially in queer communities, like. You, I don't know, like, for any person that I've hooked up with, I didn't know what they did for a living. Like, yeah, <laughs> right. Like, hi, do you um, work with, you know, at least five figures? Like, well, yeah. nobody cares about that. But let's talk about the actual stigma that comes with it. Because dating, dating as a drag queen is, is not the easiest thing. It can be ver- very overwhelming for some people that aren't used to, like, living in the lifestyle of it. Yeah, I, yeah, I can agree. But as a side note, too, uh... I, I think it's always weird when you meet a gay person and they're like, oh, well, I dated a drag queen once. Like, it's like a thing. Like, it's something that they had to overcome, almost. Yeah. Like. <laughs> but no, to get to Donna's point, which actually fits with that other point, is um, there is... Dating a drag queen is probably, like, a really ridiculous journey for people, and I get that. And actually, we probably should have a full episode about that one day, too. About yeah, Truly the ins and outs of dating a drag queen. Because what happens is... Um, drag queens are the life of the party. Um, you know, they, oftentimes they drink and they get really out there and like, you know, they're like a celebrity. It's pretty much like a normal person dating a celebrity, just in a real small microcosm of like what drag is. Yeah. I mean, a celebrity for their own community. Let's say, I mean, I, (laughs) there's a really funny thing that I saw online and I don't (laughs) know where I saw it, but it was like, why is it that like all gay men um, think that they're, like, famous or public figures. <laughs> so, like, and I think that the drag queen trope, like, the drag queen persona is, like, a, is a exaggerated, um, idea of that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, don't you know who I am? I'm Coco Gem Holiday. I'm Jonatella, my secrets. Like, you should, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. really, we're not, a, we're not a big deal. But we put ourselves in the middle of these communities where we're these figures that perform, that mm-hmm. speak out, yeah. that have platforms that we try to, 
get a bunch of people to go to our events, you know? So yeah. it's, it's, it, you have to have a certain level of people who follow you to these events and, and support you. And, um, mm -hmm. those supporters and all that kind of gives you a, a small sense of local celebrity. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about that dynamic is that, um, as drag artists, like we have so many different, we have a whole world that exists as kind of like a subsect of just queer culture in general. Mm -hmm. um, even though drag queens obviously were heavily involved with Stonewall, we, in nowadays, in modern times, like we do have this whole world that belongs to just us and us alone. And, and so people, it's hard for people to fit into that narrative. Cause that's what it is. It's a narrative to this life. They always feel like sideline characters and sometimes they feel kind of oppressed by it to mm -hmm. a degree. Um, a lot of, boyfriends of drag queens you won't see them at gigs actually they usually they're like yeah I'm, I'm good with that because usually they hang out they have to hang out with themselves like because they don't know anybody and they don't know they don't even see their partner because their partner's in the dressing room yeah yeah you have to be a very patient individual a very understanding patient individual to the process and mm -hmm. to the lifestyle and that's not always easy to find um yeah i think i think that dating is always going to be a bigger stigma but my biggest advice for that that I found is um, I definitely used to try to fit myself into other people's boxes when I would date. Um, I think it's better at this point in my life that if someone wants to stick around for the ride and if someone is interested, then I'm going to let them be and um, they can see for themselves what it's like. And each experience will be a test to see if they're balls enough to stick around. Before I started dating Adam, actually, I was dating um, around to, you know, be less sad. And I was dating a, a guy um, who I brought into the world and they were not super thrilled about the world. They're like, they're like, I'm kind of an introvert. Like, it's really difficult for me to like really bond. But if this is what you like, I'll try to make myself be interested in it. And that's what kind of gave Adam the leg up on this person was the fact that Adam could met, it didn't have to, he didn't have to push himself to be yeah. there. He could exist in the scene alone or with people. That personality type is very hard to incorporate. I've, I've dated people with that personality type mm -hmm. and it's hard to incorporate them into what it is that you like to do. Speaking of introvert, on August 1st, we have a show yes. called Introvert for all of you who want to go to a drag show but can't go to a bar. And especially right now, you can't go to a bar. Yes, and we have <laughs> queens from all sorts of different franchises, including... Um, the Boulay Brothers, Dragula. Yeah, and RuPaul's Drag Race. And Camp Wanakiki. Yeah, so, so yeah. www.thecdsdrag.com forward slash introvert. It's going to be an awesome interactive digital show. Check it out. Yeah, definitely. Just a small little plug there. Yeah. Like, if that was a commercial, it would have been better. Um, <laughs> I have one more stigma that I wanted to talk about before we get to the, before we get to our Feed the Positive segment. Mm -hmm. um, one of the stigmas that drag artists also seem to have is that they don't have the ability to be professional or not be a little shady. Like, there's this thing that, like, there's a stigma about drag queens that we are, like, we're going to steal your money, we're mean and we're rude and we only read people and we don't know how to be professional. Like, there's this stigma outside of the drag community that that's all we are. Like, and it makes it really difficult to build friendships with people. Because um, I've heard, I've heard from people in Portland even, they're like, oh, I don't really like, you know, I don't really hang out with drag queens. And it's like, no, I'm not trying to hang out with drag queens. I'm trying to hang out with you. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to build a friendship because I just moved here. Yeah. Well, I don't really hang out with drag queens. And it was just like, oh, okay. Well, hmm. dang. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. And that was, that was kind of hard. So even opinion. getting like friend blocked instead of just like. <laughs> <top blocked>. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the, wow. I was just going to say, well, and I get it. Drag queens are terrible. No. Um, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I mean. They're not the greatest people. Vain, but... vain creatures of beauty. Vain, vain creatures of beauty. Man, I'll get stuck in a mirror all day long. Yeah. Um, but so that does lead us into our Feed the Positive segment. Oh, wait, no. We got to end it on a positive note with that. But the thing is, even with drag culture, even with all these stigmas that, you know, surround us, I just encourage all of our listeners, especially if you've ever been interested in someone and you decided not to date them or you don't want to be friends with drag queens. Literally, we are all individuals. We might have some things that are similar, like the fact that we perform, but that's probably going to be about it. Yeah, that's why we're not friends, all friends with each other. No. Because, like, if I had to be friends with all these girls, I would tear my eyes out. Yeah, seriously, like, 40% of them are just awful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> so now, so that's that's more positive, and that's in any scene. <laughs> that any is scene. not specific to any scene in, that we're talking about. That is in any scene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so our feed the positive segment. So my the one that I chose to call out is actually Bougie Cherry Track Daughter Chastity. Um, I actually worked with Chastity recently on the last Introvert show, and they are absolutely fantastic, beautiful, and gorgeous in every every sense of the word. Um, you can find them on Instagram at, at @praychastity p r a y c h a s t i t y um, yeah so pray chastity on Instagram and seriously they are going through some amazing changes in life they are an underage performer um, but they really like bring it to the table and they're funny and stupid in all the right ways yes and my feed the positive is actually not a drag performer but a queer musician slash rapper um tono the rapper you can find him on instagram under that handle that is t-o-n-o the rapper um he's really awesome i've seen him perform um at darcells before doing a little bit of rapping and um is not only is he very talented but he's very sexy too um stream throne right now it's out on all major streaming platforms uh so yeah check him out yeah so i guess that brings us to the end of our episode Thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, yeah. This has been such a crazy adventure doing this all with you through COVID. Leave us comments on stuff. Like, we want to talk to you we guys. We want interaction with y'all. So if there's anything that you want us to talk about, if there's anything that you want to hear about, if you want to debate us, if you want to... if you, Actually, you know what? We're going to have some more interviews in some coming up episodes, too. So that's something to look forward to. Um, we are constantly trying new things with this podcast because we just want our listeners and those who tune in to get a good taste of what our scene is like and what our taste um, of, of culture is here in the Pacific Northwest when it comes to drag. Yeah, definitely. So make sure to follow us online at www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. Uh, That's A-J-E-M of a secret podcast.com. Yes. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye. This has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of A Gem of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Gem Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Gem Holiday at Coco Gem Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at the Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast. Dot com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.